This morning's New Testament reading is from the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verses 20 through 22. By faith, Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau. By faith, Jacob, when dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, bowing in worship over the head of his staff. By faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones. The Old Testament reading is from the book of Genesis, chapter 27. So he came near and kissed him, and Isaac smelled the smell of his garments and blessed him and said, See, the smell of my son is as the smell of a field that the Lord has blessed. May God give you of the dew of heaven and of the fatness of the earth and plenty of grain and wine. Let people serve you and nations bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers and may your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you, and blessed be everyone who blesses you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We are, it's a beautiful fall day. We are still working through our uh, passage in Hebrews. Just want to make one quick uh, fun, fun announcement. Um, Laura Bailey and Sean got married on Friday night. Um, and so a handful of us were there. So when you see them, I think we'll maybe here next week. But just let you know that was a fun wedding down in uh, D.C. It was exciting to see uh, how Lord um, blessed both she and Sean through difficult times in their life and they, how they ended up finding each other. Uh, we are uh, rounding towards the middle of the end of Hebrews chapter 11. And, uh, and we're, we're kind of doing the, the, the passage now, the Hebrews, everything up to this point has been trying to sum up Genesis. It's been a really interesting look at just a, a storyline of events that have happened in people's lives by faith in the book of Genesis. And really, we're now finishing up the book of Genesis. We're summing up, it took us all at this point to do the first probably two-thirds of Genesis, and now we sum up the rest of Genesis in just three verses. Uh, and as I was preparing for this, and it made me think about what, where, where we're going, where this is, text is kind of bleeding, it reminded me, and this will make sense in a second, it reminded me of an event that when Zinni and I were prepping to be missionaries, uh, someone uh, knowingly um, did something that cost Zinni and I a massive amount of time and a massive amount of money. Uh, they did it knowingly, they did it uh, deceptively, and uh, they did it vocally. And when it came out, we found out that this person had done this uh, without letting us know. And again, it had cost us, uh, you might wonder what the cost was. We, we had jobs that we were trying to live off of to save money to do stuff. And we had stuff ready to go. And so we quit the jobs that were paying us other salary to start living off of what people had been giving. And this person had decided to, to not file, file paperwork on purpose. And so now, instead of having other outside income that we were relying on, now we were relying on funds that people have been giving, and she, she basically cost us three months of work. Um, long story short there. And when she did this, and we asked her about it, she goes, well, you know, when God shuts a door, he opens a window. And we say, wait, that's not how the idiom works. We say that. You can't say that. You're the one who did it to us. You can't get yourself off the hook by giving a bad theological idiom. And then it reminded me thinking of some other fun idioms. There's one that came to mind when pigs fly. That's a Scottish one from the 1500s. You can imagine a Scotsman saying, you know, you can have our freedom when pigs fly. Um, and uh, another idiom, though, that re really re revolves around the entire emphasis of Hebrews chapter 11 is an idiom called in it for the long haul. That's an idiom that originated in the 1850s to talk about when you're buying freight for trains, there were short haul freight trains and long haul freight trains. And obviously the idea means you're in it for the long haul. It means you're in it, you're doing this for something for long and enduring. And really Hebrews 11 is about the long haul. And so what we're looking at today is why is it important to be in it for the long haul when it comes to faith? Or how does faith help us with the long haul? So please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We pray now for all the kids upstairs. All the teachers and parents that are upstairs, that you would bless that time. Holy Spirit, that they may grow closer to you. We pray now, Holy Spirit, you would do the same here. That you would awaken our hearts and minds to your word. May we die a little to ourselves and be more alive to you and your <coughs> word. We ask all this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So, and if I were to sum up what's happening, we have verse 20, 21, and 22. And like I said, summing up the very end of uh, Genesis. And really, there's a common theme 
if you don't notice, maybe you didn't know that, in 20, 21, 22, it's that the people they're talking about, these statements were made near the end or when they thought it was the end of their life. So it's common about verse 21, 20, 21, 22, that the people mentioned, these were end of the life statements of faith that they make. That's what makes them uh, similar to each other, why we're including them all at the same time. And what we're going to look at is these three separate verses. And really, uh, the two words you want to make note of, remember, are the word experiences and expressions of faith. We're going to look at the experience and the expressions they have when it comes to these moments, this end of life moments they have. So let's start with verse 20. By faith, Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau. That's the passage we read. Now to get there, this, to, to understand where we're at in their story, to understand the greater picture of just this one verse, the, the hearers of this would have known a great deal about the life of Isaac and his sons Jacob and Esau. And so we have to fill in that gap for you very quickly. Uh, and to do that, uh, all of you know the you know, computer malware, computer viruses? Well, there was a famous one called I Love You. Um, this was back about 18 or so years ago. This particular virus came to people on the computer and it said, I love you. And who would want to quick click a, a, an email that said, I love you? And what happened was it was a virus created by two guys in Malaysia who the, the virus would take control of spam folders and everything and end up uh, crunching your computer. This is his, um, <coughs> money from eight, 15, 16 years ago. It cost America $15 billion to take out. The estimated cost to remove that virus from computers in America was about $15 billion. And I was thinking, what a great example of sin, that it, it hides itself in something that makes you think you really want it, and then when it comes in, it not only destroys you, but it can be passed around. <coughs> And here we see with the story of Esau, with Isaac and his sons Esau and Jacob, is that you had a mother who preferred one son over another. Isaac's wife, Rebecca, preferred Jacob over Esau almost from the beginning. And when Esau, when Isaac was, they thought was near the end of his life, and it was time for him to pronounce blessings. Esau and Jacob's mom conspired with Jacob to trick Isaac, the second-born son, into getting the blessing. It was supposed to pass to the first son, Esau. The mother went at great lengths, and when the blessing was trying to see, Isaac couldn't see well. He wanted to touch the hand of his sons and give them blessings, depending on which one it was. And the mother conceived a plan to send Esau away and had Jacob pretend to be Esau. And even when Isaac was like, I'm not sure about this, she was like, don't worry, I swear, it's him. But it wasn't. This sinful feeling of she's doing what she thought because she loved a son more than another caused her to not only hurt and lie to her husband, but hurt and lie to her other son. The result of this action is very similar to the result of action of sin, which is it caused a devastation. It caused estrangement in the family. Esau said, you've, you've, you've stolen my blessing. And he goes to his father, Isaac, and says, please give me something. And Isaac does have a blessing that he reserved, that he can still give Esau, but the one he was supposed to get did not happen. And Esau hated Jacob so much that he wanted to kill him. And so Jacob had to flee. And Esau went his own way. So you have a parents who have now lost their kids, and these kids now hate each other. One is fleeing. One is brooding. And, hating. and while this estrangement is happening, God appears to Jacob and lets him know that, yes, while your mom conspired this, you went along with it. But guess what? I'm still going to work through it. And what happens a little while later is that Jacob is returning home. Good room, he had to flee. And on his way home, he finds out that Esau, <coughs> the brother he stole from, is coming towards him. Jacob rightly so, does not know what to expect. So it says what he does, he had um, family, he had wives and kids, and he lined them up, and he lined them up to kind of show Esau, look, 
if you, you know, the, the, the way historians think of that is that he lined up to show which one of his family members he thought were most important, kind of lined them up in importance. So if Esau was going to start doing horrible things, uh, Esau would know who is whom. And it says Jacob presented himself to Esau. Remember, the blessing, if you didn't care, the blessing was that Jacob, the second, was going to be over Esau. And when Jacob sees Esau, it says he bowed, <clears throat> bowed many times. And how does Esau respond? The one who took everything from him. Esau responds by embracing Jacob and saying, we are fine. You don't need to do anything. And Jacob still doesn't believe him. Jacob still argues with him, saying, you clearly can't be okay with me. Jacob can't believe what he's seeing. And Esau is saying, we are good. God is good. He has healed what no one could heal. And Jacob can't believe what he's seeing. To the point where you find out later on, when Isaac does die, it is Jacob and Esau together who are burying him. We see what was sown in evil through sin. God had changed completely and still worked his way through it. So this passage where it says in verse 20 where by faith Isaac said this blessing. Again, what happened was it was stolen. When he sent his blessing to Esau, he realized at that point Jacob had stolen it. But he still has a blessing. He still trusts God is going to work this out. Remember that if you read the passage and say that um, Isaac blessed Jacob, it says he blessed Jacob and Esau. You need to understand that he still sees God's working through both of us, even that he found out he had been deceived. And in a way that Isaac could never have imagined, they have, these brothers were reconciled. If you read the parable of the wayward son and the prodigal son, in the New Testament. It sounds very similar to that. But here it happened in reality. So the experience that Isaac had was what sin does, that it estranges us. It separates us. But at faith, that God can reconcile us. So what does sin do? It brings estrangement. What does his faith do? It brought reconciliation through his faith enabled it the moment to happen for these two brothers to be reconciled. And Isaac expressed this, remember experience, he expressed this, his faith endured in, despite, in spite of man's horrible weakness and sinfulness. Isaac's name itself means laughter because his parents in weakness laughed at God's plan. So faith shows us, remember what we just asked, what does faith do for us? Faith shows us that God is stronger than our deepest wounds and weaknesses. So the question for first part, verse 20, is what powers your faith? What powers your faith? Those are verse 21 now. Verse 21 says this, By faith Jacob, when dying, blessed each of his sons of Joseph, bowing the worship over the head of his staff. Now, uh, very common in weddings now, if you, if you don't say it, people will pop out their iPhones and take pictures everywhere of, of, the, uh, of the wedding. And most times now, weddings have to say, not only turn off your phones, but please don't take pictures because when the bride and groom turn around, they don't want to see your camera. They want to see you. Um, but what this reminds me of when it comes to wedding is what's called first look photos. Um, why I'm a fan of that, again, if you did it, don't feel like, oh, well, you know, if you didn't do it, is that there's a superstition around weddings that if you see your bride and groom, they see each other before the wedding, it's bad luck. And there's a thing called first look, which is the front photographer comes, and the first look where the, the groom meets the bride, they take pictures, they see each other before the wedding happens. And why I love that, not because they get to share that intimate moment just between the two of them, I love it because it kind of um, looks at superstition and say, our marriage is not going to be based on superstition. We don't really care about, again, don't worry if you didn't do it, I'm not judging you. All I'm saying is, why I like that is saying that, you know what? This is not how this works. A marriage doesn't work or not work because we saw each other before the wedding. It has to do with what's going on inside our hearts. 
that determines how the marriage is going to work. And why I'm sharing that now is because what happened with Jacob, he was a dad whose sons devised a plan to sell his son Joseph. Now again, Jacob was the recipient of being preferen having preferential treatment. Jacob kind of had that over his son Joseph. And the brothers, his other brothers, didn't like that at all. And so they literally sold him into slavery and tricked Jacob and his family into thinking that he had been eaten by lions. It's like horrible on top of horrible. You could have just said the man wandered off. But no, he was eaten by lions. And so here is what, imagine, I don't know if I can, but imagine you find out that your family had devised a plan to hurt your own child that you loved and then lied about it. And then you find out about it later. And this is what this passage is referencing. That at the end of all this, when everything had been revealed, where Hebrews jumps in is, again, toward the end of Jacob's life, when he is pronouncing blessings. And there's two parts here I want us to see. Is one, that he blesses every one of his sons. Every one of them. <clears throat> and what this passage is honing in on is, again, where we get the superstition part, is that he, uh, so Joseph had two sons named uh, Manasseh and Ephraim. And Jacob takes Joseph's sons, so those are technically um, Jacob's grandchildren, but he counts them in the blessings as if they were his own sons. But what he does was he reverses the birth order on them. He decides to give the great blessing to the second one of Joseph's son, and not the first. And Joseph says, wait, wait, you're mixing it up. And you've got to imagine Jacob understanding the way God works is that he can work however he chooses. He is not bound by man's efforts or by man's achievement or by man's desires. He does what he wants. Just like Jacob experienced in sin, he stole his blessing, but God still worked for that. So in a way, he was passing that on to Joseph, his precious son. He was reversing the blessing on the sons, and again, as a, some type of a connection to what happened to him, a shout out to saying, God can work through whomever is born in whichever order. That is not what's important here. It's whom God is is going to bless. So, Jacob's experience was that sin can mislead you into doing the worst of things. But he understands that faith can restore even the worst. What is he expressing in this blessing on his sons, Manasseh? Manasseh and Ephraim, is that in spite of man's brokenness, God is bigger. Faith shows us that we can trust that the results will come. That's what he's saying here. I know that it doesn't matter what we do, God is in control of the results. So the question I have to ponder is how tempted are we to give up when we don't know or can't see those results. And then we have, now this verse 22, it says this, By faith Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones. So we've been tracing a lot through um, a couple generations now. We're now at the great-grandchildren of Abraham. We're talking about Joseph doing something that they all were doing at the end. Remember, this is the end of their life. They're having these thoughts, there's these things, or where they're pondering the end of their life. It reminded me of Ben Franklin. Uh, ben Franklin, in his will when he passed away, left $5,000 to two of his favorite cities, Philadelphia and Boston, with the expressed understanding that you can only spend it after it's compounded interest after 100 years and after 200 plus years. And um, it's a long way out, right? <laughs> and at the end, when they were allowed to finally 
take out all the money that was in the accounts, both cities had $20 million that they could spend for their cities. I mean, Franklin had a long view of what needed to happen. And we see Joseph now. Remember, so we've been looking at uh, parents. Joseph is now a parent, but he was also a son who was treated horribly. <coughs> Jacob is now past him, and his sons are a little worried about, uh-oh, yeah, dad's not here to kind of keep everything copacetic. What are we going to do? And so they go, and they're trying to, this ha passage happens, uh, they're going, referencing in Genesis, then trying to say, uh, you know, let's try to make sure Joseph is cool with us. Remind him that we have family and kids. Like, remind him that, you know, we have the same parents. Like, you know, and, and they come up to him. And Joseph, in essence, cuts them off and says, you don't need to worry. I know what you're trying to do. All is forgiven. I care for you and your children as much as I do my own. The two great passages in his life at the end here that we're talking about first is one when he's talking about um, when he's trying to communicate to his brothers that his faith and his God has done something to him. He says, uh, basically, actually says, "Am I in the place of God?" What he's saying is, "I am not God. I don't know all. I don't see all. My job isn't to cast down judgment. My job." is to follow where he leads. And he says, I'm trusting God. And because I can trust my God, I, I have completely, completely forgiven you. And he says, I care about you, and I care about your children. Again, this is where the famous passage comes, which you meant for evil, God meant for good. What sin stirred up in your hearts was not able to thwart God's plan for his people. We see that time and time and time again. And the second part where verse uh, Hebrews 22 is specifically referencing is where he says, and by the way, when I die, take my bones to the promised land. They're in Egypt. They have not been enslaved yet. There's, at that point, this is what's gathered in there was the, um, the famine, and they were there, now they relocated there. They had not become slaves yet, but he's saying, listen, I heard a promise that was promised to my dad, that was promised to my granddad, that was promised to my great-granddad, that we are having a promised land. So promise me this. There was no plan in place. There was no tickets bought to leave. But promise me, when we leave this land, take my bones with you <laughs> and put them in the promised land. That's not just foresight, that's faith and a foresight and something he could not see. He totally believed, so much so, that his last will and testament is, by the way, take my bones with you. So we see that while sin can destroy, they destroyed their brother's life by selling him to slavery. But at the end, his faith revived what they had lost. In spite of man's wickedness, God was bigger and better than they were. Faith shows us a better way to live and a better way to leave this world. We see in each of these people, they're not clinging to life. What they're clinging to, by faith, is the promise of God. That's how they're leaving this earth. How do you want to leave this earth? Our faith is designed to help us through the long haul, but even beyond that. <clears throat> How this reminds me of Christ is very simple. The only way you know someone is fully committed is, <coughs> is to keep your commitment till the end. That's the only way you know. Christ kept his commitment to us to the literal very end of his life. That's how we know we can trust him. So where do we go from here? How can we live this life now? How can we live a life where we're preparing for the long haul? 
In this life, all we're clinging to is our faith and hope in Him. Well, faith, remember, is a gift that's given to us. This faith that He gives to us is in part a response to the fact that we live in a broken world. Are you still clinging to this world, or are you clinging to Him? Is your faith really ready for the long haul? Most people think Hebrews 11, the entire book of Revelation, was written to remind you that your faith is designed for the long haul, to last through your own sin, the brokenness of the world, and take you to the end of all things and beyond. So what is your faith resting on? Please pray with me. Lord Jesus, you give us a great example of what it means to have faith in the long haul. These men that we read about today, Lord God, their wives, their family, Lord, not only was it the long haul, but they did not see the promise. But the faith you gave them enabled them to endure to their last breath, knowing that they can cling to your promise, that they do not need to cling to this life, because what you have waiting for us in the future is real and is worth it. And we can trust this promise because you kept your promise all the way through to dying for us on the cross and rising again. Lord, encourage us and help our faith to rest in you for the long haul. All for the glory and sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Now, as we are preparing, for communion parents, I encourage you now to take a moment, uh, go grab your kids, and you can bring them back for communion. Um, remind you that communion is one of those ways 